Good evening, everyone. I'm Stuart Varney in for Lou Dobbs. These are the top stories tonight. A tragedy in South Florida. A pedestrian bridge still under construction collapsing onto moving traffic west of Miami, killing several people. The 950-ton bridge crushing eight vehicles underneath. We'll have a full report in moments. And also tonight, top Republican senators joining the cause for a second special counsel to investigate Department of Justice and FBI corruption. The senators demanding to know more about the FBI's use of the fake anti-Trump dossier. And embattled former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, today making his case for why he should not be fired days before his pension kicks in. But the real outrage is why he wasn't fired months ago. We'll take it all up here tonight. Our guests tonight, Congressman Ron DeSantis on the efforts to purge the deep state from the FBI and Justice Department. Congresswoman Martha McSally, she joins us to discuss President Trump's crackdown on sanctuary cities. Dr. Sebastian Gorka on new pay-to-play allegations involving former Vice President Joe Biden. And the best political analyst in the country, Ed Rollins, on President Trump's insistence that media reports about an imminent White House staff shakeup are complete bunk. Our top story, the search and rescue effort in South Florida. We're still awaiting word on the number of fatalities after a pedestrian bridge under construction at Miami's Florida International University collapsed. Fox News correspondent Phil Keating is in Miami with our report. Nearby Kendall Regional Hospital now reporting they have 10 patients they are treating, two of them currently in critical condition. We still do not know the number of dead and the number of people they believe to be still trapped and possibly alive underneath the rubble of the pedestrian bridge behind me. You can take a zoom in here and you can see one of the eight vehicles sticking out from underneath the pancake section of this massive pedestrian bridge just assembled and put straddling the street on Saturday. Saturday. It was supposed to open to the public, pedestrians only, in December. Uh, Fire Dade, uh, Miami Dade Fire, as well as police officials here, brief reporters about 4.30, and they clearly uh, emphasize this is an absolute catastrophe. So we're in a full search and rescue mode, and uh, we'll give you more information as it becomes available. We have multiple victims. Uh, the number hasn't been determined yet. The final number hasn't been determined yet, and we'll give you more information on that. We've had a national tragedy here on our hands with the collapse of this bridge. What was soon to become an iconic staple part in the connectivity between the city and the university has actually turned out to be a national tragedy. The bridge 174 feet long and it was assembled on Florida International University property along the road, Southwest 8th Street, and then on Saturday they hoisted it up and basically rotated it at 90 degrees to drop it onto its support beams on the south and north sides of the a very busy artery here in southwest Miami. We did also speak with one man whose friend was crossing the street when suddenly this bridge collapsed. My childhood friend, he was crossing as the bridge was coming down and it, and it hit him. He was rushed to the hospital. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just so worried. He was crossing the street at, at the moment that the bridge was coming down. And I don't know if he was, I, 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 I don't know really. He was just severely injured. This was supposed to be a pedestrian bridge on the scale of landmark status as the Skyway Bridge in Tampa. In fact, the same construction company involved in both projects. FIU is on your screen left and the Sweetwater municipality on screen right. And those are new dorm towers up there. So several uh, thousand people uh, live right across the street and were planning to use this pedestrian bridge. It was supposed to be a bridge to the future and today it is an absolute catastrophe. All right, thank you, Phil Keating there. The Trump administration today issuing sanctions against Russia for meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential elections, also accusing Russia of a concerted operation to hack the U.S. energy grid and other critical infrastructure. Those targeted include the 13 Russian nationals and entities recently charged by U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller. Growing calls tonight for a second special counsel to investigate Obama-era Department of Justice and FBI corruption. Four Republican senators, Judiciary Chair Chuck Grassley, Lindsey Graham, John Cornyn, and Tom Tillis. 
today sent a letter to Attorney General Jeff Sessions saying a special counsel is needed to gather independently the facts and make prosecutorial decisions. The senators say the author of the discredited Trump dossier, former British spy Christopher Steele, misled the FBI. And it's critical to know whether the FBI misled the FISA court in obtaining a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. Our first guest has been leading the charge for a second special counsel since last summer. Joining me, Congressman Ron DeSantis, a member of several key committees, including oversight and government reform, foreign affairs and judiciary. Congressman, welcome to the program. Good evening. Spell it out. Why do we need this second special counsel? Well, for a couple reasons. One, the Department of Justice just can't investigate itself. It has a conflict uh, if it's being called upon to investigate the actions of high-ranking officials, ranging from Jim Comey to Andrew McCabe to people like Bruce Orr at the Department of Justice. The other reason is, look, there's evidence that federal statutes may have been violated here. You look at Christopher Steele and whether he was honest with the FBI. You look at somebody like Jim Comey who leaked his memos, one of which very likely included classified information. So I think if you look at this from the start of the Hillary investigation, taking it through that conclusion, through the Russia, so-called Russia investigation, all the way through the appointment of Robert Mueller, yes, the FISA abuses are a big part of that, but I don't think it's exclusive to that. It's the only way to get at the truth, correct? But the problem with it is it stretches out over a long, long period of time. So this is round the country's neck for a long time to come. Well, here's the issue, though, Stuart, is Sessions initially said he was going to appoint the inspector general. Uh, the inspector general would work much slower than an actual uh, special counsel because the, special, uh, the inspector general doesn't have subpoena power to bring people in outside the department. So he wouldn't be able to bring in Christopher Steele or Comey or McCabe when McCabe officially is either fired or leaves the department. So you would actually get it done quicker. And then also, yes, there have been special counsels that have kind of run amok, but that's the fault of the people who are supervising the special counsel. There's nothing to say that you can't give a special counsel very narrow um, grounds and say, look at all this stuff, charge people if they violated the law, and if not, stop. We don't want it to be a fishing expedition. That's what the Mueller thing has become, and that is not good. I agree, but it does not have to be that way. Who makes the call? Who says, yes, there will be that special counsel? The Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions. Okay, and do you expect him to say, yes, here comes the special counsel? Well, he's moving in that direction. I think he should have said yes a long time ago. He's, he's announced that he's appointed a prosecutor from outside of D.C. who's within the Department of Justice. I don't know if that's considered a special counsel or not. It can be considered that. Uh, so I don't know if he's gone all the way, but clearly he's gone further than he was willing to go just a couple weeks ago. Uh, so in that sense, I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged. But now that he's got four very significant U.S. senators writing to him, I hope he'll just do the right thing. Get somebody from outside the swamp, put them in there, and let's finally get the truth. And if people violated the law, they need to be held accountable. Um, Congressman, news today that Robert Mueller has subpoenaed the Trump Organization to turn over documents. And um, before you uh, talk, talk about this, I want to read this from the New York Times. They said their breathless statement of what's going on. It is the first known time the special counsel has ordered the documents directly related to the president's business be turned over. What do you make of this? Well, it's hard to know because obviously we don't know what they're all doing. But I think if you look at this investigation, uh, most of the, all the charges that have been brought have nothing to do with the Trump campaign and collusion. It's things that happened either long before the campaign, like with Paul Manafort, or it's been process crimes, people like Michael Flynn and Papadopoulos. And so to me, because when Rosenstein appointed Mueller, he didn't identify a crime to investigate. He basically just said investigate links between Trump's mm -hmm. campaign and Russia, that pretty much gave Mueller a mandate of, hey, just find something. So I think this is part and parcel that he's just trying to find something. That's not the way prosecutions uh, or investigations are supposed to go. There should be a basis for doing it. And I'm just not sure that that's the case here. Otherwise, it's just a, a grand fishing expedition. I think that's what we're seeing. But uh, let me go back to Jeff Sessions. He is considering, that's the use of the word there, considering whether to fire McCabe at the FBI. Can you spell out for our audience what Mr. McCabe is allegedly being up to? 
So the inspector general who's been investigating how the Hillary case was handled for over a year now, we want that report soon, um, his conclusions is that McCabe was engaged in misconduct during the context, during the course of that investigation. And his recommendation, this is a, a nonpartisan IG, he has recommended that McCabe be fired. Uh, and so my view is, is if that is what the inspector general is recommending, if in fact you think McCabe has committed misconduct, then I think Sessions needs to fire him because the American public are sick of people in government. They're not held accountable. But you can bet your bottom dollar if a citizen got out of line, people like McCabe and the FBI would be the first one to pounce on them. Mr. Sessions has a lot of uh, invest he's, he's got a lot of big decisions to take, and that's a fact, and take them soon. Congressman Ron DeSantis, a pleasure, and thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you. We're coming right back with much more. Stay with us, please. President Trump slamming the national left-wing media over claims of chaos within the White House. A very exaggerated and false story, but there'll always be change, and I think you want to see change, and I want to also see different ideas. We take up the potential changes with Ed Rollins next. And growing problems for Nancy Pelosi as Dems distance themselves from the minority leader. Those details and more when we return. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says she doesn't think Connor Lamb won Pennsylvania's special congressional election by running an anti-Pelosi campaign. I don't I think that he ran against me the entire time. I think he ran on his positive agenda. I don't think that that really had that much impact on the race. He won. Hmm. That could be a pretty tough sell considering Lamb ran this ad for nearly a month. My opponent wants you to believe the biggest issue in this campaign is Nancy Pelosi. It's all a big lie. I've already said on the front page of the newspaper that I don't support Nancy Pelosi. All right, joining me now, the best political mind in the business. His name is Ed Rollins. He's sitting right next to me. Former Reagan political director, Fox business political analyst. Ed, you're all right. And I've been fighting Nancy Pelosi. We grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area together. We've been... <laughs> Opposite sides right? for forever. So, uh, <laughs> and I think she should retire. She's three years older than I am, and I'm going to be 75 next week. So it's her way past her time. <laughs> okay, let's, let, let me backtrack just a second <laughs> yes. here, Ed. Are Democrats running away from Nancy Pelosi? In some districts, a district like that, certainly, uh, you don't want to advocate uh, uh, that, that, that you want to project what you're about. And, and what he projected very well is he's not going to go be a left wing liberal San Francisco Democrat. He's going to be someone who represents the conservatives, uh, the Trump's supporters in Pennsylvania. That's why he won that case. Is it an open revolt? Well, not open, but it is a large scale revolt at this time I think, that really challenges I, Pelosi. I think the vast majority of members who appreciate all she's done in the sense that she's raised a lot of money and she was a good speaker from the Democrats' perspective, but they'd be very happy if she became Speaker Emeritus or if she retired back to San Francisco. What's your judgment of the president's speech in Pennsylvania on Saturday night? He Pre went on for well over an hour. It was Trump unleashed. The president, president closed the gap. There's no question this was a race that was down 10, 12 points in the polls. He closed the gap. We're not going to win the majority of Republicans in the fall based on the president alone. We're going to make it if the candidates who are running beat their opponents by arguing the president's programs, economic right. programs and what have you, will be successful. So the best uh, argument I can make to any candidate is, elect me, I'm going to Washington to work with Donald Trump to make him president. This man who won basically said, there'll be times I'm going to work with this president on the best interests of the, and he was a Democrat. That was very powerful. Look, the economy is growing Absolutely. very nicely, thank you. And by next November, it's really low. Be... And there's now talk of the second phase of tax cuts. And whether we get that or not, we don't know, but they're talking about it. Right. That's an encouragement for the economy. The president is going to run in the midterms, the Republicans, on his record. They, in some respects, I think Republicans will walk away from Trump the persona, this brash character. Well, again, Trump alone can't carry all these members that are out there. He can go out and help in some cases, some of the districts not, not as much, but the economy is what he is the architect of and that's what they want to sell. Do you think it is chaos in the White House as described by the media? 
I think any White House, having worked in two White Houses and having worked in three administrations, is a very hard place to work. I don't think it's chaos. I think the president is trying to find a team that he's comfortable with. He didn't know a lot of these players. He wasn't a politician. He got a lot of people basically recommended to him. And I think what he's discovering is when, uh, when Tillerson basically has opposite views from what he has, you don't want to put Tillerson on an airplane going out and have him saying things across the world that aren't what He's in agreement. The president is a guy who's the only one who has the right to be there. He gets to pick his team. He gets to have anybody he wants in there. And he basically, is, it's his, his decisions that he makes. Do you think that the, the, the frequent change in top-level staff, does that affect the president's ability to implement his program? It does not affect this president. Some presidents it would. But this president basically thrives well on chaos or anything else. And at the end of the day, he's functioning very well. He's very comfortable. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's grown. Not You can't say the man's grown into the job. He's but he's com stamping he's, his he's persona all He's comfortable. Over he's comfortable. What he's learned, and, and having, as, again, having spent a lot of years in the White House, you all of a sudden realize how it works. Uh, when you get in there, you do not, you know, especially a guy like him who'd never been president, never been in politics, all of a sudden you get in there and you say, you know, this, I can do this job. All I got to do is make decisions. They, they, people help me put the packages together, and I have to make the decisions. Once I make the decisions, I want them implemented. And he's very comfortable with that at this point. The man is completely different from any other president in my lifetime. I teach a course the American presidency at Hofstra, and there are 44 men who have been president. Uh, he's the 45th president, one who served twice, and there's never been one like him. I said to the, the head of the site department, you know, we have to redo this course because Trump is separate from everybody else. Do you think we'll get used to him? I think over time, I think I think a lot of people are getting used to him now. I think the bottom line, if he's successful, he may never be as popular as, as a Reagan or someone else during his term. Mm. But at the end of the day, people are going to look back and say, you know, he was a darn good president. Uh, uh, he made things work. He fixed the economy, which was the key thing. I know it's a long way away, but does he win in 2020? Uh, I think he definitely can win. I think the bottom line here is the Democrats have, it's always a game of uh, who's running against you. And I, and I think he's, I think there's no one can beat him in a primary. And I think to a certain extent, there's no Democrat can beat him today. All right, Ed Rollins, it was a pleasure. A pleasure. Good to see you again, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Do you believe the FBI Office of Professional Responsibility should be investigating all the rogue employees involved in corrupt subversion of President Trump? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. And follow Lou on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like him on Facebook and follow him on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street, stocks flows mixed. The Dow gaining 115 points. The S&P, though, down two, with the Nasdaq down 15. Volume on the big board at three and a half billion shares. Optimism among, among home builders sliding this month, but still near an 18-year high with builders citing concerns about finding buildable areas. And a reminder to listen to Lou's report three times a day, coast to coast, on the Salem Radio Network. Next, explosive new pay-to-play allegations involving Joe Biden, a new book alleging the vice president's family benefited from his dealings in China. We'll take it up with Dr. Sebastian Gorka next. A bombshell new book exposes deep financial links between former Vice President Joe Biden's son and the Chinese government. According to an investigation by Clinton Cash author Peter Schweitzer, Biden's son inked a billion dollar deal with a subsidiary of the Bank of China just 10 days after he and his dad visited the country in 2013. Joining me now, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, former strategist to President Trump, now a Fox Business national security strategist. Where's the outrage? Where's the reporting of this? I haven't seen any. Could you imagine if a fraction of this story was alleged against Jared Kushner? I mean, the, the book is just out. Peter Schweitzer and his team did an amazing job on Clinton Cash. But, but in a nutshell, the story is, as you said, the uh, stepson of John Kerry, the son of Joseph Biden, when they were cabinet members of the Obama administration, created a new investment fund called Seneca. They inked a billion dollar deal with the Chinese government, the Bank of China, and then together proceeded, this is just one example, to buy a US manufacturing company called Hennings that was making very sensitive equipment crucial to our, our American military here at home. This, it, uh, look, I, I'm very rarely at a loss for words, Stuart, but this is potentially one of the biggest pay-for-play scandals we have ever seen outside of Uranium One. If they were the sons of Chinese leaders, they would be called 
princelings who have notoriously gotten very rich from inside dealings. And now it's the sons of leading American politicians making a great, uh, apparently making billion dollar deals whilst their dad was actively working in the Obama administration. I mean, I can't imagine anything like this before. This is really a bombshell story. It is. And, and as you say, we expect this in a country like China, which only pretends to have a free market and where the, 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 the most impressive, biggest companies in China are always intertwined with the Communist Party, the Politburo and the leading families of the Communist Party. But this is happening in America. And at the same time, not just linked to government, Stuart, this is when John Kerry is ex officio the chairman of the CFIUS committee, which has to approve these deals with communist China. Oh, and by the way, he doesn't recuse himself. They approve this deal with communist China. It, it, is, it is stunning. You know, before we went on the air, I was talking to you indirectly about this story, and you said you were gobsmacked. Now, I believe that that is a British expression, and I'm familiar with it. And, sir, you used it accurately. This is an extraordinary story. I've got to move on. I've got limited time. I've got a lot for you to go at here. If Jeff Sessions, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, does not fire McCabe, and if he does not appoint a second special counsel, should President Trump fire Jeff Sessions? Look, I made a promise to my old boss, the president, that I wasn't going to attack sitting members of his cabinet uh, from outside the building. I'm not going to do so. But at the end of the day, this isn't about one man's pension. This isn't about McCabe's pension. This is about felonies. We have se senior individuals in the U.S. government at the highest levels of the DOJ and FBI that are clearly there, there is, you know, reasonable suspicion that these individuals were involved in felonies such as the illegal surveillance of of US citizens. So action has to be taken. I don't care if it's Jeff Sessions. I don't care if it's the president, but we must restore law and order in this country. I, I'm not that familiar with the legalisms of this. What I am familiar with is the whole idea that there is a cabal operating within the FBI, which sought to exonerate and protect Hillary Clinton and do down the incoming president, President Trump. That is an extraordinary situation to have senior members of a chief law enforcement operation in the United States of America actively working against and undermining an incoming president. That's another thing which I've never heard of before, period. Not, not only that, so that in itself is a real blow to the integrity of our way of government. But on, on the flip side, let's look at the backstory to how that FISA warrant was illegally acquired. Hillary Clinton financed a Russian propaganda campaign. How do we know that? Because the Steele dossier was knowingly built on false Russian propaganda materials. Uh, Christopher Steele was in contact with Russian agents. She pays millions of dollars for it. And then that oppo research is used to justify the secret surveillance warrant. We've never had a presidential candidate paying millions of dollars for a hit piece in a secret court to spy on Americans. Stuart, if we read this in a Tom Clancy novel, we'd say, this, is, this, is, no, this could never happen, this is absurd. It happened. You know, I think many people are, they're not following this minutely and very closely, but you obviously are, and you just spelled out an extraordinary story. Thank you very much indeed. Sebastian Thanks, Gorka, Stuart. you, sir, are all right. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers indeed. We're coming right back with much more. Stay with us, please. No sanctuary for cities that provide safe harbor to criminal, illegal immigrants. We discuss the latest legal victories in the battle to protect our borders with Arizona. Congresswoman Martha McSally, next. The French Alps, like you've never seen them before, when we come back. California continues to flaunt America's immigration laws. Here's the latest outrage. The Senate president has appointed an illegal immigrant to hold a state office. Lisbeth Mateo will work on the Student Opportunity and Access Program Project Grant Advisory Committee. Mateo says illegal immigrants are not adequately represented in government. <laughs> 
My. Joining me now, Congresswoman Martha McSally, a member of the Armed Services Committee. She's also running for Arizona's open Senate seat to replace outgoing Senator Jeff Flake. Can I just go back to that for a second? An illegal immigrant in California holds state office and she works on the Student Opportunity Access Program Project Grant Advisory Committee. Your comment, please. Stuart, I don't know what's going on in California these days. Every day there's a new story about this where they're just defying federal law and the responsibilities that they have in order to keep their community safe, in order to represent their citizens. And uh, so this is just another example. And look, I'm a strong 10th Amendment's right kind of person, uh, but clearly enforcing immigration law and making sure that we have criminal aliens not on our streets, uh, not released from prisons, and then committing additional crimes against people is the responsibility of the federal government. And the state and local government cannot go against that. And so th they should not be picking this fight. Well, they should be spending more time focusing on uh, creating jobs and helping the homeless and all their other flawed policies in California with well, their high taxes. They're all moving to Arizona uh, <laughs> in order to get away from the conditions there. I'm sure you're glad to have them. But look, it, it seems to me, and I report on this daily, it seems that California is sec seceding, that they're not really part of the union. And I also feel that President Trump is confronting that head on. You pleased to see that? Well, we're a republic, and so, you know, we've got very different states, obviously. Uh, you know, Mississippi, Maine, Alabama, California. But what's going on in California right now? Again, they are defying... Uh, complying with federal law and federal responsibilities. Uh, they are choosing to emphasize this and to put all their energy into this issue instead of addressing the very real issues of the people who live in California, the citizens in California. Uh, and it's absolutely appropriate for the Trump administration to be taking them on for this. Think about Kate Steinle's family. I mean, she's the one that a lot of people are aware of, a uh, criminal alien who was deported five times, was let out of prison, and because of the policies in California, they weren't allowed allowing ICE agents to simply go into the prison and pick him up in order to keep the community safe. So then he was allowed to be in a position to shoot and kill Kate Steinle. It makes no sense. They should be allowing those federal agents into the prisons as opposed to trying to find them out in the communities again. These public safety issues are very real and the grieving families that are out there are dealing with them every single day. So they need to stop picking this fight. It's absolutely appropriate for the federal government to be challenged them on this uh, and really focus on keep their community safe provide better opportunity and jobs and, you know, clean up their act. I see, however, that the president is pushing back hard and is winning some rounds. For example, a court in Texas says it, it is okay to ban sanctuary cities. That is a significant yeah. win for the president, and that yeah. ruling could actually be applied in other states, other sanctuary areas. Yeah, th th this is a big win. Again, it's uh, it's federal law. It's very clear. Uh, the, it's the law of the land. And this ruling in Texas, I think, is going to reverberate into other places. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, there has to be this lawsuit for California. Uh, but I think they will pr ultimately prevail uh, because it's the responsibility. They cannot thumb their nose uh, at these important issues uh, in, 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 with the, the sanctuary state that they have, not just sanctuary cities. Uh, yeah. Look, uh, you know, I've long uh, supported a border wall system. I said the other day, maybe we need to build a wall between California and Arizona because their dangerous policies are going to impact the rest of us. This is the whole point. If they're letting criminal aliens out onto the streets, they don't just stay in California. Uh, they're impacting the rest of the communities potentially around the country. Um, and that's not their right to do that. I believe that next week you'll be going to the White House discussing the wall. I take it you're pushing fervently for it, correct? Yes, I just had a hearing this afternoon. I'm the chairwoman of the Border and Maritime Security Subcommittee, and we had officials uh, from DHS and CBP and also representing the Border Patrol agents talking about the importance of the request that's come over, uh, $33 billion uh, for a border wall system uh, and roads, uh, access, uh, technology, and the Border Patrol agents that we need to secure our border. Okay. I'm representing a border district, and the ranchers and the border res residents that I represent are dealing with cartels trafficking through their ranches and into our communities every single day. This is very real. And so I'm uh, honored to be invited back to the White yep. House again uh, for this conversation next week and continue to advocate uh, to crack down on sanctuary cities and secure our border once and for all. And, and it's great to have a president who has the will to do that. And you are running for Senate and you are with Trump and you're with the wall. Martha Absolutely. McSally, thanks for joining so, us. Pleasure. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you very much.
All right, be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Do you believe the FBI Office of Professional Responsibility should be investigating all the rogue employees involved in corrupt subversion of President Trump? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Now, please roll this video. You'll like it. A daring athlete conquering the French Alps with skis and paragliding wings. Will you look at that? The extreme sport is called speed flying, and it is a pretty good way to soar over trees and taking breathtaking views. Just stay up in the air and firm on your skis and you'll be okay. Not sure I could do that. Next. Pompeo set to take the helm at the State Department ahead of a critical meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Fred Flights takes up the high-stakes summit and a whole lot more next. The United States does not have a bloody nose strategy for a limited preemptive strike against North Korea. Well, that's according to the head of the U.S. military's Pacific Command. Admiral Harry Harris testified today before the Senate Armed Services Committee about the military options being considered. I'm charged with developing uh, for the National Command Authority a range of, of options uh, through the spectrum of violence. And, and I'm ready to execute whatever the President uh, and the National Command Authority directs me to do. Uh, but a bloody nose strategy is, is not contemplated. We have to be ready to do the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and we are ready to do the whole thing if ordered by the president. Mm -hmm. All right, do the whole thing. Joining me now, former CIA analyst Fred Flights, now a senior vice president of the Center for Security Policy. He's also the author of the new book, The Coming North Korea Nuclear Nightmare. Now, there's a title to conjure with. All right, Fred, <laughs> welcome to the program. Good to see you, sir. Good to be here, Stuart. Now, why hasn't Kim Jong-un said a single word or put out a single statement about the proposed meeting since it was first announced? I don't believe he said anything. Well, he has, but can I also comment on the bloody nose strike? Sure. Uh, someone in the NSC leaked that to the news media, and according to a South Korean newspaper, it had a real effect on the North Korean government and may have convinced it to open up negotiations with the South and go to the Olympics. I think the Trump administration backed away from that, whether it was a real policy or not, basically because the, the South Korean government hated the idea. But let's not pretend that no one in the Trump administration uh, was behind this. I think somebody was. But the idea that the Kim, the Kim government hasn't responded to the president's agreement to a summit, I think the president, by throwing out the diplomatic rule book, uh, surprised the Kim government as much as he surprised everyone else around the world. I don't know if the offer was serious or if the Kim government thought that the president would accept so rapidly, and I think they're now trying to figure out what to do. Well, Kim Jong-un has never faced an American president like President Trump. Mr. Trump is always keeping his opponents off balance. That's what he does, and I think he's very good at it. But this meeting uh, where might it take place? I hear that Sweden is a possibility, but I can't imagine Kim Jong-un wants to travel overseas. He doesn't know what's going to happen back home. I don't think that's going to happen. The, the North Korean foreign minister traveled to Sweden. I think this is because Sweden is the protector power of the United States in North Korea, and there were some discussions about improving relations between the two nations. I wouldn't be surprised if the summit is held in Beijing or maybe in Panmunjom, the truce village. I'd like to see it take place in Seoul. I would like to see Kim Jong-un exposed to the prosperity and freedom of South Korea. I also think there are some malign forces behind the scenes that manipulate Kim Jong-un. I'd like to see him less sus uh, suspect to them, uh, susceptible to them, and meet with the South Koreans and the U.S. in Seoul. Is it possible that at the end of the day, we'll get a deal something like this? Denuclearization in North Korea. Proven, validated, the nukes are gone. In return, American troops gone from South Korea and no American nukes in South Korea. Is that a possibility? Well, there are no American nukes in South Korea right now. I don't think U.S. troops are going to withdraw. And I also don't think this offer for a summit is legitimate. I think that the, the North is doing what it has done for, for, for decades. They want to divide the U.S. from other countries, get concessions, buy time to develop its nuclear weapons. They're going to have to go a long way to convince us 
that they're sincere. We have to assume right now that this is a ploy, and this particular set of talks probably will be inconclusive. But President Trump has, has, has he's not proven, but he's made the point that everything is on the table, and you never know what he's going to do next. The use of force by this president is what brought the North Koreans to the table. The fact that this president, he said at the United Nations, I'm prepared to totally destroy North Korea if it threatens the U.S. and its allies. I think that put the fear of God in the government in North Korea and at least forced them to change tactics. I'm smiling. Uh, it's a very serious subject, but I'm smiling because I can't imagine any other world leader and certainly no other American president saying anything like that to Kim Jong-un before. And, at, and at the UN. He said it at the UN. It really had... Remember how outraged the world's diplomats and foreign policy experts were. Yeah. Now we have Kim asking for a meeting with the president. Yeah, it works. Fred Flights, you're all right. And thanks very much for joining us, sir. We'll Good see you again here. soon. Yes, sir. Got it. Up next, Pelosi in peril. More Democrats likely to abandon Pelosi after the Pennsylvania special election stunner. We'll take it up with our panel next. President Trump today meeting with Bill Gates at the White House. The discussion was closed to the press, but Gates told Politico earlier he does not agree with the president's America first approach. And the help we provide to countries uplifting them. We have made the world a, a more stable, uh, a richer place. Well, so why was he at the White House? I mean, <laughs> I've got a theory. Joining me now, defense attorney Rebecca Rose Woodland and New York radio host Mark Simone. I don't think they were talking foreign policy. I think Bill Gates was there to grind his axe about China stealing his software. And China trade is very much in the news. And I think the president wanted to talk to Bill Gates about that. Am I wrong, Mark? No, absolutely not. Good. I didn't even you know they stay on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know they still had Microsoft. <laughs> You're Mr. Microsoft, I know. I do own some Microsoft <laughs> stock, and I should declare that fully and, and, and out front here. But I honestly think that could have been a serious topic of conversation. Well, the reason stated was that Bill Gates' foundation, you know, he's trying to give money to the developing third world countries, and that he was there to discuss some ways to do that in conformance with the government and with the president. I do think while he was there, he gave his information, he gave his ideas, he gave his thoughts to President Trump on some of the uh, taxes, on some of the steel issue, the tariffs, um, whether wanted or not, I'm sure Bill Gates did offer I, that. I, I would be prepared to bet that the president did most of the talking and he was talking right at him. <laughs> well, having uh, watched uh, the president in these meetings, he's, he probably asked a lot of very shrewd questions. He knows the theft of intellectual property. Gates was one of the first victims and he probably wanted to amass a lot of knowledge there and use that in that tariff fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to break away for a second because we have the so-called news today that Robert Mueller is subpoenaing uh, some documents from the Trump organization. This is how the New York Times breathlessly reported it. It is the first known time the special counsel has ordered that documents directly related to the president's business be turned over. Fishing expedition, isn't it, Rebecca Rose? Yeah, I mean, look, so far we haven't seen much. So. He's just continuing and continuing, but we're not getting any answers. We're just getting more investigations that seem to lead are nowhere. We, are we all getting sick and tired of this? What is it? We're a year into this. No collusion, no evidence thereof, and it just goes on and on and on. They're looking for something. They're looking for anything to justify their position. But it's a year. It's $12 million later, and they haven't found anything. I know they'll say, well, there's indictments, there's guilty pleas. None of them have anything to do with Russia. And uh, Trump said that's the red line when you go into his business and he should take action he should put in somebody else besides sessions and that somebody should rein in Mueller and focus him too late now this is an ongoing investigation I don't know what on earth it's ever gonna stop do you No, I don't think we any of us do because he has free reign should <laughs> yeah do you think the president should fire him well that you see that's now, where it becomes, that's where it becomes very difficult because even for for him in terms
bombshell new book exposes deep financial links between former Vice President Joe Biden's son and the Chinese government. According to an investigation by Clinton Cash author Peter Schweitzer, Biden's son inked a billion dollar deal with a subsidiary of the Bank of China just 10 days after he and his dad visited the country in 2013. Joining me now, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, former strategist to President Trump, now a Fox Business national security strategist. Where's the outrage? Where's the reporting of this? I haven't seen any. Could you imagine if a fraction of this story was alleged against Jared Kushner? I mean, the, the book is just out. Peter Schweitzer and his team did an amazing job on Clinton Cash. But, but in a nutshell, the story is, as you said, the uh, stepson of John Kerry, the son of Joseph Biden, when they were cabinet members of the Obama administration, created a new investment fund called Seneca. They inked a billion dollar deal with the Chinese government, the Bank of China, and then together proceeded, this is just one example, to buy a US manufacturing company called Hennings that was making very sensitive equipment crucial to our, our American military here at home. This, it, uh, look, I, I'm very rarely at a loss for words, Stuart, but this is potentially one of the biggest pay-for-play scandals we have ever seen outside of Uranium One. If they were the sons of Chinese leaders, they would be called princelings, who have notoriously gotten very rich from inside dealings. And now it's the sons of leading American politicians making a great, uh, apparently making billion dollar deals whilst their dad was actively working in the Obama administration. I mean, I can't imagine anything like this before. This is really a bombshell story. It is. And, and as you say, we expect this in a country like China, which only pretends to have a free market and where the, 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 m the most impressive, biggest companies in China are always intertwined with the Communist Party, the Politburo and the leading families of the Communist Party. But this is happening in America. And at the same time, not just linked to the government, Stuart, this is when John Kerry is ex officio the chairman of the CFIUS committee 